one of the most important of the Dutch uh, uh, female painters is Judith Lester. And she's quite different than the ones we've seen before because instead, uh, she does paint some still lifes, uh, but predominantly she paints people. Um, she's a Dutch Baroque genre painter. So the first thing I should probably do is define genre painting. Genre, uh, just as a word, uh, just means type or kind. Um, but in the context when you'll say, oh, someone's a genre painter, they're talking about one particular kind, which essentially is pictures of ordinary people doing everyday things or paintings of everyday activities. Someone singing, drinking, making music, uh, pouring milk, um, um, just you know, everyday activities. Now, that's one of the interesting things about Lester because most of the Dutch women artists uh, that we've seen, uh, and most of them, were still life painters. And you could be a still life painter without having to uh, study uh, human anatomy, and uh, uh, you, could, you, know, you could set up your still lifes in your home. Um, but Lester goes beyond that, and she paints human beings in their everyday activities. Uh, one of her favorite themes is music, and you'll see this uh, over and over. Uh, here we have the, the young boy who's playing the flute uh, with the violin, uh, and it looks like a recorder or uh, hanging on the wall. And I should talk, about, I guess, about uh, the composition a little bit, too. Uh, once again, you've got that kind of uh, diagonal. Uh, and then the repetition of some of these curving forms, uh, but also some angular forms, which draw your eye, as you can see, uh, back to the instruments. And uh, there's a kind of parallelism between the curve of the boy's head and the curve of the uh, violin. Okay. We mentioned this near the beginning of the class. Uh, this is a painting which is uh, sometimes called a merry company. It's a, a man and a woman having something to drink, and uh, looks like they're uh, perhaps making music. Uh, it's in the Louvre, uh, the Musée de Louvre in uh, Paris, and dates from uh, 1630. Now, the interesting thing about this painting was that it was once thought to be by Franz Hals, who was a very important painter from Harlem, and obviously a male painter from Harlem. And it was displayed during the 19th century as this great painting by Franz Hals. And then they cleaned the painting. And when they cleaned the painting, they found Judith Lester's monogram, uh, which she signs her paintings with a J and a star, because Lester means something like lodestar or uh, the pole star. So uh, she uses that as, as a uh, kind of signature, as a monogram. And when they found out that it was by a woman artist, they immediately put it in storage and didn't show it until, of course, uh, finally, uh, you know, women artists now are uh, respectable again, you know, willing to show them in museums. This is her self-portrait, and we'll be talking more about this, but let me just tell you a little bit about some of the things that happened during her life. Uh, she was a member of the Harlem Painters Guild. She became a member in 1633, and she had apprentices, including, of course, male apprentices. Now, there's very strict guild rules about what you can and cannot do. And Franz Halls lured one of her apprentices away. Now, apprentices have to pay a fee to their master, and they sign a contract, and it's legally binding. So Lester took Halls to court, and she sued him, and she won her damages. I should say one other thing about Judith Lester and Franz Halls. Um, they're both artists that are working in Harlem, and they both paint with loose brushwork, although Lester sometimes seems to be able to uh, vary her brushstroke uh, with the, you know, uh, the uh, spirit of the times, what is desired by the clients. Um, and it used to be said that Franz Halls was her teacher. Uh, but I notice they're not saying that anymore. And I think that probably there is no documentation about that. Uh, they certainly knew each other, as you can see. <laughs> uh, not necessarily a master-pupil relationship. It may have been two colleagues who sometimes got along and sometimes didn't, evidently. In 1636, uh, Lester married a painter, uh, uh, Jan Molinar, and they had three children. Now. In this case, it seems that Lester's artistic productivity declines with marriage and with domestic duties, which would make perfect sense. Uh, she did continue to paint, but just not uh, as pro 
she wasn't as prolific uh, because she had uh, other things that she had to do. Uh, they moved to Amsterdam and then they moved uh, to Heemstede, which is where she died. You can see her in this, this is a detail of her self-portrait where she's uh, painting a musician uh, who's uh, a fiddler. And of course she is known for her genre painting. In 1636, uh, she married the painter Jan Molinar. They had three children. And here is one of the problems for women artists. Uh, after she was married, she had domestic duties and her artistic productivity declines. She continued to paint, but just uh, at a much reduced uh, rate. Uh, the couple moved to Amsterdam, uh, they moved to Heemstede, and uh, that is where uh, they lived there, and Lester eventually died there. Just to give you an idea of her husband's work, uh, this is a really interesting painting that's in uh, the Virginia Museum of Art in Richmond. Uh, it's a very large painting, uh, and as you can see, uh, it has two names. Uh, they call it a married company, uh, with uh, a man make, uh, figures making music. Uh, they have several figures, uh, and women and men together. Um, and it's also been suggested that it might be an allegory of marriage, uh, that the harmony of the music is supposed to refer to the harmony uh, in marriage. And uh, you can see the dogs there. Uh, and the dogs, of course, re refer to fidelity. And uh, uh, so uh, he's, pa he's a painter of uh, genre scenes as well. Uh, this is Judith Lester's self-portrait. We've been looking at it, but now I'd like to talk about it a little bit more. It's in the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C. And you see her sitting there, uh, and she, when, a, when an artist is showing their self-portrait, they're trying also to show how they want to be seen. And she's shown as a very successful woman artist who is poised and self-confident. And it looks like she's been painting, and we've just walked into the room, maybe interrupted her. Uh, and she turns around and she smiles at us uh, as, as though she's going to greet us. Um, so this, this momentary po pose that she's just stopped mo working for a moment. A um, couple of things about that pose. Um, Lester is very well known for painting smiling figures, which uh, is a very difficult thing to do. Uh, so she's, she often shows merry figures, merry companies, uh, people smiling, people enjoying themselves. The other thing that's interesting to me is when I was in school, um, you know, we talked about uh, paintings uh, by Rembrandt, which were group portraits in which, for, for example, the uh, syndics of the Draper's Guild. Uh, and it would be the momentary poet pose as though you had been interrupted. Well, those paintings are a lot later. So obviously, um, this uh, motif of uh, the artist who is at work or the person who has been interrupted and looks out at the viewer and draws you into the painting uh, is something that was there before Rembrandt, something that Lester was using herself. Uh, here we see a detail of what she is painting. She's painting a genre painting, and she's painting a fiddler, a musician. Of course, she's known for her genre painting. Uh, and then I have some nice details of this. She's wearing very elegant, beautiful garments. Um, they're not royal garments or aristocratic garments, uh, but they're very much upper middle class garments. And she has this uh, ruff, for example, that's very starched, and then has lace at the edge. She has the little Dutch cap uh, that's uh, really transparent. And her cuffs, as you can see, are transparent. So it'll be very, very, very fine uh, linen. Um, the other image that I really like is the uh, palette and how very, very free her brush strokes are. You can see the lace uh, and uh, you know, the tip of her nose and uh, other places, just little highlights uh, shining out. And then when you look at her palette, uh, it is just so free and uh, thick paint, uh, brush strokes where you can really see the stroke of the brush. Uh, I said I could take little details out of this and probably try to convince you that it was uh, some kind of abstract expressionist painting or something from the 1950s. Uh, of course, we can see her. We can see that it isn't. It's uh, got her uh, her paint strokes and her her the painting rag and her fingers and uh, things of that nature. So there is Lester. One of the pictures that I had you read about uh, the article by Hofrichter. Uh, is about this painting, uh, Judith Lester's The Proposition. 
And essentially, it's a very, very different kind of genre painting. There's a lot of paintings in Dutch art, as we'll see, um, that have the sexual proposition in one way or another. But in this case, it's from the woman's point of view, which is very, very unusual. Uh, what we see is a uh, room with the, the tenebrism we've talked about with the Artemisia Gentileschi, where you have just this little oil lamp burning, and uh, the woman is a seamstress. She's, she's sewing away uh, late at night uh, with only this, this light uh, to, to uh, illumine what she's doing. Presumably, she's quite poor. Um, she's dressed very modestly, very plainly. Uh, her garment comes right up to her neck. There's no decoration. And the man who's standing next to her is uh, touching her arm and holding out his hand in which there is a gold coin. Or there are gold coins, uh, several coins. Well, maybe they're not gold. Uh, the man is touching her arm and he's holding out his hand on which there are coins. So what he's trying to do is, uh, that's, that's too much money for the sewing. Uh, what he's doing is offering her money uh, for a sexual favor. And one of the things that's, th that's so touching about this is um, the vulnerability of the woman. She's all alone. She's all alone in the dark. Um, there is no male protector. You can see that she's a virtuous young lady. Uh, she's wearing the very modest, plain dress. And what she's trying to do is simply ignore his advances. Now, I don't know what you, what your mother told you, but my mother used to tell me, <laughs> uh, somewhere anyway, I got the idea that, you know, if somebody said something was a little risque to you, you just, you just don't understand it. Well, half the time I didn't, but, you know, you just didn't understand it. And they'd go away, and they'd stop doing that to you, and they'd realize that you were a good girl. And so this is exactly what's happening here. She's, she has no weapons. She doesn't have a brother or a husband to come in and chase the predator away. She's just hoping that he will give up because she's a virtuous girl, girl woman. She's a virtuous woman. One of the interesting things about this, too, was um, there was a big problem with prostitution. Uh, or maybe some people, didn't, well, there was a big problem with prostitution. A lot of girls would come in from the countryside um, and they'd be very naive. They'd come to the city, they'd think they were going to get a job as a servant or as a seamstress, and they'd find out either they couldn't make a living that way or they couldn't get a job, or um, as a servant they were sometimes expected to put out sexually. And some of them end up as, uh, many of them ended up as prostitutes. Um, and uh, the brothels were a big business. Uh, they still are in Amsterdam, I think of it. So let's take a look at some of these other uh, pictures of uh, sexual encounters and uh, show you how different they are and uh, what the impact of Judith, Judith Lester's proposition was. Um, this is a, a painting, a, a bit earlier than hers, as you can see, uh, Dirk von Barberens, The Procurus. And it's a very large painting. It's uh, in Boston, the Museum of, of uh, Fine Arts. And uh, the procuress is the old lady who presumably at once was a prostitute herself and is now beyond that. Uh, and she's demanding money. Her hand is out and she's pointing to her hand uh, and, and well, the, for the uh, services of the, the young woman uh, who is uh, smiling at her customer. And the customer, uh, the man, is holding up a coin. And she's smiling at him, and she's playing music, which suggests uh, something that, um, uh, like I said, the seduction. And as you can see, she's just about falling out of her dress. Uh, obviously, she is, in this case, a willing participant. She looks like she's going to enjoy it, even. Uh, so that's, what is it, the male point of view for the seduction, or uh, uh, everybody, everybody's getting what they want. This is a very interesting painting. <laughs> um, incidentally, I will tell you, this painting was stolen from the Gardner Museum in Boston. Uh, and I've never heard that it has been recovered. Um, it's no one, well, various names. One is The Concert. And it's by Jan Vermeer, who is, of course, one of the most important Dutch uh, Baroque painters. 
Um, it's a very interesting scene because you know it, it's you see uh, an interior with a woman playing on you know, a harpsichord, perhaps uh, some kind of uh, mu musical instrument. Uh, there's a man who's either listening or perhaps giving instruction. Uh, we can't t quite tell. His back is to us. Uh, and there's another woman who seems to be uh, singing. So they seem to perhaps be entertaining the man. And you know, this could just be a family gathering, uh, something kind of nice, except notice something. On the wall behind the singing woman, <laughs> is Bumbaran's Procurus. Now, Fermer was not only a painter, he was also an art dealer. And when he painted his paintings, he often would put up some of the paintings that he had as stock, evidently, on the, on the walls uh, of the, the rooms that he was painting. And so we wonder, is, is this supposed to give us a sign that Maybe this isn't such a um, harmless, uh, friendly, family get-together. Perhaps this is a brothel. Uh, not as sleazy as Bomberans, but uh, there is certainly that suggestion that there is some kind of uh, sexual possibilities here. And one of the things um, that did happen after, uh, after um, Lester's painting of the, the proposition was that you started to see these somewhat ambiguous pictures, and sometimes not ambiguous, as we'll see, uh, but these what we can call a quiet brothel scene, uh, presumably higher class brothels, um, and um, where they would make the, they wouldn't just come in and have sex, they would make the customer comfortable, they would uh, have uh, conversation and music. Um, and as I say, sometimes we just cannot tell. You know, in, in this case, it's the uh, pro procurus hanging on the wall that makes us wonder. Another one of these ambiguous pictures is Terborg's painting in the National Gallery of Washington that now bears the title the Suitor's Visit. Well, of course, we don't know what the original title was. Uh, that's a modern title. And what you see uh, is a uh, man coming in. He's bowing very respectfully. Uh, there was a dog standing between him and uh, the standing woman. Uh, the dog uh, could be either his dog or her dog. It's not quite clear. And uh, the woman is dressed with uh, beautiful satins. And behind her, there's a, uh, a young lady uh, playing music, playing a lute, uh, and uh, a, uh, an older man. Now, here's the question. Is this what the modern title implies, a respectable offer of marriage? The suitor has come uh, to see his uh, potential bride-to-be. He's very respectful to her. The dog represents fidelity. Uh, and they're well chaperoned. Uh, her sister is playing music in the background. And the father is watching over them. Or is it one of these quiet, high class, if there is such a thing, uh, brothel scenes uh, where the young lady is the prostitute, and both young ladies are. Uh, and the, uh, but this is, you know, this is not a raucous place as we see in uh, Barberin's Procurus. This is a place where you're expected to have good manners. And uh, the young ladies are given these beautiful uh, garments to wear for the time being. They don't own them. Uh, they're paid very poorly. As I said, there was a, there was a big problem of, of seducing young ladies into um, the, this, this life because uh, they needed to, to make a living. Um, and um, as I said, they were very, very poorly treated. But you know, on the surface, it looked very nice because they had beautiful clothing. Of course, they're making music. Uh, and then that would mean that the man is not her father, the man in the background is not her father, uh, but is the procurer, the pimp, we might say, or the owner of the brothel. Uh, you can see here the beautiful fabric textures for which uh, Terborg and other Dutch Baroque artists are so well known. Well, here's another painting by Terborg. 
it's no longer ambiguous. This is a painting in Berlin. Uh, it used to have a title, which it doesn't anymore, of the father's admonition. And how it was interpreted was the young lady was the daughter, uh, and her mother's there having a little glass of wine while her father raises his hand and uh, tells her to be a good girl, or something of that nature. But then they cleaned the painting, and they found in the man's hand a coin. He's holding up a coin, and what we're seeing is a quiet brothel scene. Uh, the woman is not the mother. Uh, she's the procuress. And the man is offering for the young lady's services. So Paul Frichter feels that this type of brothel scene was, was the influence of Lester, uh, that they didn't have to be quite so uh, raucous. They could be uh, uh, quiet and still. I have to admit, it seems to me that what happens is they missed the point because in these scenes they may be quiet, they may look more genteel, uh, they may look like a higher class establishment, but they missed her point. Her point was that the woman was unwilling and this woman may be unwilling. She's got her back turned to us, we can't see, but she's, she's, she's stuck. So the male scenes continued, continued to show a somewhat a willing woman. Um, and uh, all I can say is they missed the point. <laughs> I'm back and just showing you some other paintings by uh, Lester here, the people making music, the flute player, the lute player, uh, very free compositions. Uh, the jolly topper, that means somebody who's been drinking a bit, and they're quite happy. Sometimes they call them merry companies. Here they've been drinking and making music and smiling and laughing and happy. Um, Occasionally, however, there's a more serious side to the genre painting. This is a painting by Judith Lester, and incidentally, her paintings go under a variety of names. I saw that one that was called A Merry Company, being called A, a Serenade, and um, all sorts of different things. Uh, this one is sometimes called The Last Drop. And it's one of those paintings they cleaned. Uh, it used to look like it was just, it's in Philadelphia. And it used to look like just a man who is smoking and, and, you know, and his friend and they're drinking and they're smoking. And then they cleaned it and they found out that the background had been overpainted and that underneath the overpaint was a skeleton uh, who is holding a skull. So this is a representation of death. And uh, you know, there is a moral message to this one. They're talking about the brevity of life. And uh, I suppose it could even be serve as a, a kind of poster. You know, if you keep drinking and you keep smoking, it's going to kill you, uh, quite literally. But uh, back to her more happy themes. Uh, this is a very freely painted painting uh, in the National Museum of Women and the Arts. And uh, it's known as the Three Musicians, or just as the concert. And I took the pictures I took, and we've tried to do some color adjustments because if some of you know, when you take a picture in a museum, you have artificial lighting, and uh, the colors can kind of come out all yellow or something else, depending on what kind of lighting it is. Uh, the little picture there is the one I took off their website. I don't know that the colors are exactly accurate, but as you can see, mine, we've, we've done some color correction, but uh, uh, it's still a little bit dark. So you see three people making music. Uh, and they have, uh, according to the website uh, for the National Museum of the Women, Women and the Arts, uh, you have a very accurate depiction of the instruments. And that this is the uh, kind of violin that you would see in the 17th century. It doesn't have a chin rest and it's held against the chest. Otherwise, it looks pretty much like a modern violin. Um, and that there might be a kind of uh, meaning to uh, this, that uh, the uh, kind of an allegory of harmony in a sense. The musicians have to work in concert to create the harmony of their, mu of their music. There's another thing that's been suggested, it's not certain, but that possibly these are actual uh, portraits of people. Uh, that the woman who seems to be smiling and probably singing uh, is a self-portrait of Lester. And uh, we have that idea of the concert as an allegory of harmony. 
And so I'm going to add a little thought there, which of course uh, is the idea that perhaps they're talking about marital harmony. The date that the museum has given this painting is uh, around circa 1633. And since they say circa, I assume that, that there is not a date painted on it. So if this is painted slightly later, say after 1636, perhaps it could be an allegory of marital harmony. Uh, Lester and her husband and a friend are making music together. Uh, this is the uh, figure playing the uh, violin. The violinist may be Lester's husband, Jan Molinar, and they don't know who uh, the smiling man uh, here playing, I guess it's a lute, uh, is. Uh, maybe it's a family friend. Uh, maybe the harmony is not the harmony of marriage. Maybe it's the harmony of fellowship between friends. But uh, as you can see, very, very freely painted. Now, I said one thing that Lester, Lester is known for her genre paintings. She paints so many different kinds of genre paintings, but she also uh, can paints uh, still life objects. Uh, this is a watercolor painting, um, which she did as a botanical illustration. Um, this, was, this was one uh, way of making money. The, okay, I should explain to you about the tulip craze. In the 1630s, tulips were being imported from Turkey, from Persia, and there were, these were these exotic flowers uh, that became so popular in the Netherlands. And people would pay a fortune for rare bulbs. So they were invested, investing in tulip bulbs just the same way that people uh, invested in the dot-coms or the uh, inflated mortgages, uh, all of these things where we've seen uh, the markets crashing in our own time. Um, this is what happened. The tulip market crashed and people lost their fortunes. But tulips were <laughs> very, very popular. Uh, the the tulip mania uh, 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 continues in a sense. They're not investing fortunes in them, but uh, tulips are still much beloved uh, in uh, Holland and uh, other places as well. Well, one of the things that they had were what they called the tulip books, and these essentially were sales catalogs, and uh, they needed to have accurate botanical illustrations to show what the flower would look like for their sales catalogs. And so Judith Lester, among others, was hired uh, to paint these, and this is, this is essentially what it is. And then um, I was trying to find a still life, and I did find this picture on the web uh, of a still life that is supposed to be by Judah Lester. Now, one of the things I find interesting is uh, a lot of times we talk about uh, women artists, and we very frequently people compare them to male artists. Uh, it used to be they were always compared in a negative manner. Oh yes, they're just weaker followers of so-and-so. And the assumption that women were always followers was there, and the fact that they were always weak, not the fact, the assumption that they were weaker was just there. Um, so it really helps if we go and look at some of the paintings, I think. So what I'm going to do is show you uh, some of the men in her life. Uh, and uh, you'll see that there's certainly some similarities um, and differences. Um, these are other painters who were working at the same time, Franz Halls, and here we see uh, Franz Hall a portrait of a woman and a Judith Lester portrait of a woman. I don't think there's any quality difference in those. Uh, certainly very similar um, pose. I found a date for the Lester, but I did not find a date for the Halls. And uh, this was kind of fun. Uh, she and her husband both uh, portrayed children I want to say tormenting little kitty cats. Uh, her whole, the cat looks a bit afraid in both cases. Um, in Lester's picture, and we'll see, see a couple of them because she does one that's a little closer to her, her husband's too, but in Lester's picture you have that diagonal, uh, the hair is flying around, everything's very freely painted. The poor little cat looks like it's curled up and is just terrified. The kids are having a good time. Um, and then uh, her husband's painting, Molinar's painting, uh, is much it's um, compositionally much quieter. You've still got the grinning kids uh, smiling and uh, one of them is pointing to the cat whom he's holding and the cat obviously doesn't want to be held. 
Um, there is a, another Lester, which is a lot closer to that, as you can see. Here's the boy with the big hat and uh, uh, the, same, the same general composition uh, changed a little bit. Um, this uh, idea of the children with a cat may refer to a Dutch proverb. He who plays with cats gets scratched, uh, which means something like if you're looking for trouble, you're going to find it. So maybe the cats will have their revenge. <laughs> And then I just thought this was a very beautiful little picture of a child, uh, once again, very, very freely painted.